Hey guys, welcome to the channel, as you see in the thumbnail what if, Issei befriended Rias as human. Before I start, please do support for more awesome content and subscribe my channel and like this video. Go support and follow the Belial the Liar for writing that awesome fanfic, and also make sure to comment on this story, link in the description. Let's start this video. Issei lay in the grass, a soft wind blowing over him and lightly rustling the tranquil trees above him, sending a single leaf fluttering down onto his nose. Cozy. Issei cracked an eye, wondering who disturb him. It was important-looking girl with red hair and blue-green eyes, standing over him with a mischievous smirk. I was. Issei said shortly, closing his eye again. Napping on the first day of school. Honestly, I should tell the council. Not napping, just existing. Right, existing. You're not, oh you're not high, right? No. Just checking. That was a pretty high thing to say. Well, why don't you just exist at the orientation, instead of out here in my garden? It's too noisy over there. Too many people, all talking nonsense. Your garden was quiet, peaceful, nice. Was being the active word, there. You know, if I didn't know any better, I'd think you were shooing me out of my own garden, Issei Haidu. You know me. Issei cracked an eye again, looking once more at the intruding girl. I do. Issei Haidu, now a second year, star student. Kind of a loner, but extroverted when he needs to be. I mildly honored, and mildly creeped out. You're right. I overhear a lot of talk about you. Rhea's Gregathy. After a brief silence, Rhea's laughed out loud. She started laughing so much that a tear fell from her eye, and she sat down on the ground so she wouldn't fall over. Issei watched her with the one eye, wondering what was so funny. Her laughter was contagious, though, and soon he was grinning widely too. After a moment, Rhea's finally compassed herself, wiping her face. It's Gremory. Rhea's Gremory. Well, I mean, I was pretty close. Rhea's giggled. If you say so. I'm surprised you didn't know it, honestly. Most of the guys in your class worship the ground I walk on. Humble, aren't you? I didn't mean it like that, it's just weird, I guess. To be treated like a princess by people you don't even know. Rhea said, solemn. Normally, this wasn't a topic she'd talk about with someone she'd literally just met, but something about his say just made him easy to communicate with. I bet. It's weird enough that you know my name, but for a whole class doting over me. I'd die. I much prefer to just sit in the back and be unknown. Hence, why I'm laying in your garden. I'd like that too, I think. Issei let out a good-natured sigh and pat the grass next to him. Rias contemplated for a second, then joined him. It was more relaxing than she thought. So, you're a third year, right? Aren't you skipping orientation too? Optional for third years. I had something to take care of with my club, so I did that, and then I just didn't feel like going, so I thought I'd come check on the clump of weeds in my garden. He's still here. Issei laughed, not expecting to be called a clump of weeds. Oh well. You know what just occurred to me? If your boyfriend finds us, he might get the wrong idea. Boyfriend? What on earth are you talking about? Really? The great Rias Gregathy herself doesn't have a boyfriend. I'm shocked. Well, there's someone, but I hate his guts. My family is making me marry him after I graduate. Rias cringed at having to mention her fiancé. Please, let's not talk about that. He's pushing the engagement now more than ever. Must be hard, being so above us average folk that you still have to worry about outdated stuff like arranged marriages. My heart goes out to you. Tell him to screw off. Rias laughed humorlessly. Yeah, I wish it was that easy. The comfortable silence ensued, both of them just feeling the breeze and enjoying each other's company. I got asked on a date yesterday. Really? Exciting. Who was it? The girl named Uma Mano. Not from our school, never even seen the uniform before. What did you say? Told her I'd think about it. I don't know if I'm really feeling the dating life. I kinda like being by myself, you know. Kinda. You said kinda twice. It's a two kinda kinda thing, sister. Rias laughed again. They two sat in silence, merely basking in the shade and cool breeze. It's time for us to go, President. Issei and Rias both looked over at the source of the new voice, an elegant looking girl with crazy long black hair tied up in with orange ribbon. Rias sighed and stood up, Issei following suit. They both dusted themselves off, and Rias turned to Issei, who was preparing to leave. Hey Issei. You don't mind if I call you Issei, right? As long as I don't have to call you Grimory. It's a mouthful. Rias smiled again. Rias is fine. Let me give you my number, you seem fun. It's all a facade. I'm actually super boring. Issei took his smartphone out of his pocket and handed it to her. Rias smirked as she entered her number into his contacts, then handed the phone back. Alright Akeno, I'm good to go. Don't be a stranger, Issei. Rias walked off, leaving the bewildered black-haired girl and Issei standing alone. 
The Kano, regaining her composure, turned to him. Issei, huh? Just a heads up, you're the only boy she's ever given her number. She eyed him up and down, like one might assess a piece of meat. You are kinda cute. I'm a Kano. Hope we see each other AGAI and Akeno said, winking and walking in the same direction as Ria's. Issei, now alone amongst the trees and grass and flowers of Ria's garden, looked around. He didn't really know what to do with himself, having successfully talked to the two most popular girls in school and apparently impressed both of them. Hugh Issei mumbled to himself, cheeks red, as he slowly walked back to the school building with a dumb smile on his face. One of the school idols had called him cute and the other had given him her number. Score. Issei sat alone at the lunch table furthest from the door, tucked in a corner. All by himself, by choice of course, he had a book in hand and a half-finished tray of whatever garbage the school had cooked up that day. It was the same routine just about every day. Issei sat alone, read a book, went back class at the end of lunch. Nobody bothered him, he didn't bother anybody. And that was how he liked it. Of course, a certain Riti didn't really care much for any of that. Hi Issei. Rias. You have this lunch. Uh, yeah. You haven't seen me? Ria's asked, mildly offended but not really. Yes I wasn't looking. So, uh, not to be a dick, but what are you doing here? Issei asked, not putting down his book. Ria's had just sat down at Issei's table, much to the chagrin of her unofficial fan club. She didn't have a food tray or anything, just her book bag and a smile. What do you mean? I came to sit with you. She answered, smiling. Why? I mean, I'll like, why me? I'm sure there's a ton of other people you'd rather sit with. Issei asked, tumbling over his words in a way entirely out of character with what Ria's had seen so far. Not really. Believe it or not, I don't have just a whole lot of friends, and the ones I do aren't at this lunch. So, I came to sit with you. Is that alright? Ria's asked, tilting her head. Issei, out of reasons to deny her, just smiled. In an instant he regained his usual composure. Sure, why not? As long as you can keep your lovers from attacking me, that is. Issei gestured to behind Ria's, where the next table over was full of boys glaring holes into him just for being near their idol. Ria's just sighed. Ignore them, please, I really wish I didn't have all this attention, to be honest. Well, I dunno. As our school's resident wallflower, let me be the first to tell you it's not all it's cracked up to be. You're the first person to ever sit with me, actually. Ria's looked surprised. Really? Issei nodded, finally putting his book down. He memorized the page he was on, closed it, and laid it on the table, giving the retreat his full attention. Really? I'm not a fan of too many people anyway, but still. Must be nice to be a celebrity sometimes. It has its perks, but I think I'd rather blend in with the crowd. Well, if it makes you feel any better, you blended in well enough that I never noticed you had my lunch. Or that you existed, for that matter. I can't tell if that should hurt my feelings or not. Would you rather I be one of those lapdogs over there? No, no, definitely not. So, anyway, did you decide if you were going to go on that date with what was her name? Yuma. Yuma, yeah. Nah, I turned her down. Something about her gave me some seriously bad vibes. Well, I guess that's good weight. Seriously bad vibes. What are you, one of those new age mystic types? Do you read fortunes? Ria's asked, giggling. Issei wasn't hurt by the comment, in fact. Well, as a matter of fact, I do. So glad you asked. He was delighted. Wait, really? You actually read fortunes? Ria's asked, a hint of disbelief in her gaze. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, not fortunes, in the literal sense more like personalities. Want me to do yours? Issei asked, already digging around in his backpack. Sure, why not? Is it magic? Ria's asked, smirking. Now, that was a bit of a loaded question, but Issei answered in kind. Sure is. Everything is, if you look at it right. But the triumphant aha. Issei pulled a deck of odd cards from his backpack. Arrow cards? Don't you know those are just a gimmick? Ria's asked, intrigued nonetheless. Oh, by themselves, sure. It's you and me that make the magic, Red. Check it out. In a fluid and obviously well-practiced sleight of hand trick, Issei flicked the cards out over their table, spreading them evenly out in front of Ria's. There were 22, one for each of the major arcana of the tarot deck. The girl looked on in admiration for the neat display of card skills. Well, let's get started. How you feelin' today, sister? Issei asked, a glint in his eye and a smirk on his face. Well, I... Ah, don't tell me. Pick a card. Issei said, gesturing out over the upside-down cards. Ria's pointed to one, and Issei slid it over towards himself, then pointed back at the rest. What's something you really want? More than anything else. Issei asked, only slightly more serious. Ria's, without hesitation, picked another card. 
Issei, once again, slid it towards himself. Doing great. Two more questions. Are you sure this is magic? I feel like I'm getting swindled at a carnival. The Luva carnival, huh? Anyway, next question. How do you see yourself? Rias pondered this one for a second, but hesitantly picked a card. Once again, Issei slid the face down card over to him, before asking his last question. Alright, last one. Ready. Sure, I'm eager to see what you've got. You and me both. So, here it is. What's your natural hair color? No way in hell it's that red. Rias, not expecting that at all, laughed out loud. Issei noted how pristine and beautiful her laugh was, and couldn't help but smile a bit with her. Once she calmed down, she wiped a tear from her eye and inhaled deeply, trying to compose herself. Well, if you must now, it is naturally that red, thank you. Rhea said sarcastically twirling her hair around her right index finger, making Issei chuckle. Alright, for real this time. What would you like to do with your life? Now, this time, Issei didn't let her pick just any card. Of the 19 remaining cards, Issei pulled 10 away, leaving a row of 9 in front of Rhea's. She looked at him with a question in her eyes. Would you pull those away? I was about to pick one of them. She asked, pointing at the cards he'd pulled away. I don't want you to, Issei replied, looking her in the eyes and pushing the line of cards straight off the table and onto the floor. Well, maybe I will anyway, Rhea said, before ducking under the table and grabbing one of the fallen cards. Issei, now put in a compromising position of sitting at a table with Rhea's gremory on all fours underneath him, was suddenly subject to the death stares of every kid in the room. Rhea's came back up, with a card in her hand, facing away from her and towards Issei. Idly, he remarked that her card was the Hierophant, upside down. How very fitting he thought. Smiling like she'd won, she slapped the card face down and slid it towards Issei, amongst the other three she'd chosen. Alright, alright, alright let's see what we got. Issei, making a big show out of the whole thing, acted like he was about to flip them all over. Before sliding every card, even the one she hadn't chosen, back into his backpack. Rias looked flabbergasted. Issei had a shit-eating grin. Would you do that? Rias asked, trying to understand. Issei began picking up the cards on the ground, ignoring the girl. She ducked under the table, waving at him. Uh, hello earth to ISSEI. Finished collecting his cards, Issei came back up, Rias following him. He sighed, then looked her in the eyes. You're probably thinking, what was the point of me picking all those cards if he was just gonna put the back in the backpack, right? Issei asked, smiling. Well yeah. Rhea said, mildly confused. See, here's the real trick. You said it yourself tarot cards don't have any magic to them. The magic is in the presentation. Riddle me this, what's the first question I ask you? How my day was going? And it's going pretty good, right? Yes, but how did you know that? The look on your face. What was the second question? What I want more than anything else. See, that's where the real magic kicked in. That first question. A throwaway, to make sure you know how to play the game. Know what was important about drawing the second card, though? Rias didn't reply, she just tilted her head. It wasn't the card itself, Issei leaned in, getting closer to Rias. It was how fast you picked it, he explaining, whispering. Rias blinked. What? See, you cold have picked any card in this deck, and it wouldn't have mattered. It's still just a card, laid out in a random order that you never would have known. That's why a tarot deck is so unreliable. Now, what was reliable, was how fast you picked. Because you picked so quick, I'm guessing you only want one thing, more than anything else, and you know exactly what it is. Issei asked, squinting. Rias, impressed, sat back. Wow. No, you're right. But that's more of a mind game than anything. Oh, totally. But we aren't done yet. Knowing what I do about you, I'd wager to say that all you want is to break free of that marriage, right? With a dickhead. Rias nodded slowly, pursing her lips. Now she understood the game and realized Issei may be smarter than she gave him credit for. And then, for the third question. I asked you how you see yourself, and you hesitated that means you don't really know. Maybe you'd like to see yourself one way, but your actions paint a different picture. Maybe you want to be one person, but can't help but be someone else. Who could say? I don't know you well enough to guess one way or another. But then, what really told me a lot was the last question. Really? Enlighten me. Rias, now extremely interested in Issei's parlor tricks, was eager to see what he'd gleaned from the rest of his game. He'd been right on every count so far, though she might not admit it. Don't mind if I do. What I did was give you 19 options. Then, when you were about to pick, I took most of them away. You didn't like that, and you went for one of the stolen ones anyway. What that tells me is that you hate when people try to decide stuff for you, and if I had to wager a guess, it means that all you want to do in your life is to make your own path instead of other people making it for you. Right. Rias was silently stunned. 
all of that was stuff that you could easily figure out, given that you knew her for a while, but Issei had talked to her all of twice, maybe 15 minutes altogether, and he'd already pieced together major parts of her personality and life goals based on a little game. She was more than impressed, even if it was just some mind tricks. Wow, no, that's completely right. You got me. I'm impressed. Rhea said, giving him a little round of applause. Issei gave a little bow, grinning. See what I meant, though? The cards don't really mean anything, it's just you and me making the magic. That is neat, I will admit. No any other fun tricks. Well, just one more. Issei put his hands together, covering his four left fingers with his two leftmost fingers on his right hand. When he pulled his right hand away, it appeared as if his left thumb had disappeared the classic vanishing thumb trick. The two shared another laugh, Rhea's yet again surprised by Issei's goofy jokes, only for them to get cut off by the school's bell lunch was over. As everyone began collecting their things and moving to their next classes, Issei and Rhea stopped in front of the door they were going separate directions. Oh, well. That was the most fun I've had in a while, actually. I hope you don't mind if I sit with you more often. Oh sure, don't let me stop you. As long as your fan club stays the hell away from my kneecaps, I'm good. Rhea's laughed. See you later Issei. Issei sat in his last class of the day, twiddling his thumbs and waiting for the sweet release of the bell to set him free. The class was English, and even though he was already fluent, they made him take it regardless. Of course, nobody knew that he was fluent except the student council president, who was also an apt speaker of the language. You still need to take it to refine your grammar if nothing else. The bespectacled class president had said, in English. Issei harumphed in his seat, drawing glances from some kids nearby. If you're so eager to leave, Mr. Haidu, why don't you translate this for me? The teacher asked, before writing down a phrase on the board in Japanese. Because nobody knew Issei was fluent in English, though many suspected, he would always pretend to be bad at it in class to annoy his instructor. That said, whenever the teacher got a little full of herself, he liked to remind her to stay humble. Can you imagine an imaginary menagerie manager imagining managing an imaginary menagerie? Issei said flawlessly, shooting the teacher a cocky grin. She was a particularly abrasive person and had chosen a tongue twister in the hopes of stumping even Kuo's up-and-coming star student. She had failed and the disgruntled teacher made an almost unnoticeable TCH sound before returning to her normal lecture. Right when she began, however, the bell finally rang, signaling the end of the day. Issei was out of the classroom before anyone could say hey and he was quick to make his escape. Or, at least, he attempted to. For what seemed like the millionth time in the past two days, his solitude was foiled by a redeed. Where are you headed off to in such a hurry, Issei? Rias asked, approaching him from behind. Issei sighed, then turned around and smiled. It was a strange thing to be addressed so casually by the school's number one beauty. Just headed home. Got a little stuffy in that classroom, so I wanted to bail. You? I'm heading home myself. Surprisingly enough, I've got nothing to do this afternoon. Rias, being who she was, almost always had herself wrapped up in some kind of club or school business. Cool. The two of them walked amidst all the other people in the hallway, both kids sticking out like sore thumbs Issei, because of his vehement refusal to wear the school's uniform properly, he preferred to open it up and wear a t-shirt, and Ria's because of her hair, naturally. So how's your day been? Ria's asked, smiling her usual evanescent smile. Boring as hell, the usual. Thought about skipping for a while, but when I went into the hallway to leave, I saw the council press glaring at me. Gave me the chills. Ria's laughed. Yeah, Sona doesn't take any nonsense. Sona. I thought it was Sauna, or something like that. Guess I misheard. No, you're right. We've just been close for a while, so I call her Sona. Rias explained, not skipping a beat. Touché. I've never been able to skip on her watch, that girl's a devil. More than you know. Rias said with a smirk. And, hey, don't skip classes. That's bad. She said matter-of-factly, but with a smile and a good-natured undertone. Issei snorted. If I had a dollar for every time someone said that, I'd be rich. Way I see it, I'm still at the top of my class, skipping or not. Got me there. What's your secret, anyway? You don't seem the type to study. It just comes naturally to me, Issei said, shrugging. No secret to it. Must be nice. Ha. Ah. I thought you of all people would understand how wrong that is. Issei said with a smile, before realizing exactly what he said. Rias was looking at him oddly, and she had every right to that had been an odd and slightly presumptuous thing to say. Ah, sorry. That came out wrong. Anyway, you mentioned that you're not busy. Issei asked, changing the subject. Rhea sensed a lot of moving parts behind his previous statement, but chose not to pursue it for the time being. She filed away that particular slip-up for later and kept talking in stride. MHMM, completely free. Why? 
Wanna go grab something to eat? I'm starving. Issei offered, rubbing his poor neglected stomach. Behind him, the feral growls of all Ria's fanboys could be heard rolling across the hallway. In their defense, it did sound an awful lot like he was asking her out. Sure, why not? Ria's answered, and Issei mentally did a backflip. What did you have in mind? A Raymond stand. The look on Ria's face was one you could only call confusion. Issei had brought them to a duck in Raymond shop with a wooden exterior doorframe that had the words best in Japan. Worn away till only Bap remained. A faded gray tarp acted as a door right next to a long window that couldn't be seen through from the outside. Yeah. Why the long face? Never had street food before. Issei asked, sensing her discomfort. Well, not really, no. Ria's answered, slightly shaking her head. Oh, right. I forget that great Ria's Gregory comes from a seat of nobility, too high in the clouds to deign us commoners with their presence. Oh, woe is Emi Issei began to dramatically act as if he'd been mortally wounded, kneeling on the ground and clutching his chest. Ria's laughed, but at the same time wondered how Issei could do something like that without being embarrassed. They were in the middle of downtown Kuo, surrounded by strangers who shot him a cacophony of odd glances. It's Gremory. I feel like you're messing it up on purpose, now. Ria said, rubbing her chin in mock detective style. That's exactly what I'm doing, Jermori. So, you're not too good for a Raymond stand, right? I can vouch for the quality. Issei said, getting slightly more serious. Only slightly, though. He stood up off the ground, brushing off his legs. Ria's knew what Issei was doing. She was confident that he had a firm grasp of her personality, so the line about being too good for a Raymond stand hit her just right, and she knew he did it on purpose. Of course not, let's do it. Ria said, waving off his comment. Great. My treat. Issei said, and walked under the tarp door. The interior of the Raymond stand was little more than a bar and some stools, with barely enough room to move around in. Issei confidently walked in and took the stool nearest the door, while Ria's was slower and looked around quite a bit. After taking in the meager sights, she sat down next to him. They had apparently been the only ones in there for a while, because the stand's owner and sole employee was asleep in a chair behind the bar. Hey pops, wake up. Issei said, throwing a coaster at the man. He hopped up with urgency. The owner was an elderly Japanese man, long in his years but as young at heart as any kid could ever be. He was wearing a white cloth around his head tied back like a bandana and a black apron over a white jumpsuit. When he saw Issei, he cackled a laugh and stretched his hand out over the counter. Issei reciprocated the hearty laugh and bumped his fist against the old man's. Thought you were dead, pops. Issei said, smirking. Not yet, not yet. Hey you little shit, who's your girlfriend? First time you ever come here not by yourself and you don't even introduce me. The man said excitedly, talking to Issei like a family member would. Well, I didn't have to worry about it when you were snoozing. This is Ria's, my friend from school. Issei said, waving in her general direction. Ria's, this is Chow, a dirty old man who pretends to run a Raymond shop. Ria smiled and Chow laughed out loud, playfully reaching over the bar and tussling Issei's hair. They seemed far closer than just a shop owner and a regular customer. She noted that there were a few picture frames on the bar, and all of them were of Chow and Issei save for one, a dusty picture of what looked like a young Chow, standing with a foreign woman and giving a thumbs up at their newly purchased Raymond shop. It's good to meet you, Mr. Chow. Ria said, slightly bowing her head. Chow snorted a laugh. You too, sweetheart. Chow got really close to Ria's and narrowed his eyes. So, what's he paying you? Not nearly enough. Ria said sarcastically, making Chow roar with laughter and Issei crack a grin. Without another word, Chow began to pull items and ingredients from shelves and cabinets behind and underneath the bar, and Ria's realized there wasn't a menu in front of her, or anywhere for that matter. Looking for this? Issei asked, holding up a menu. This is actually the only menu in the whole place. Well, I was. Should I not be? Ria's asked, sensing that it might not be a normal restaurant. Nah, Chow's got it. Yeah, Chow's got it. Chow said, looking up from a pot of boiling water and flashing a thumbs up. I see. Ria's briefly wondered what kind of place she'd found herself in, that there was only one employee, and he didn't even ask what she wanted before he started cooking. This was quite a switch from what she'd normally been exposed to, and she wasn't really sure how to act. You've never been anywhere like this, have you? Issei asked, catching on immediately. No, not even almost. It's interesting. Ria's answered, trying to find the right word. The shop was nothing special, even a little rundown, but there was something uniquely picturesque and lovely about the whole thing. It had the perfect homely coffee shop aesthetic and seemed like somewhere you could stay for hours without realizing any time had passed at all. She liked the atmosphere quite a lot, it was a far cry from the ritzy places she was accustomed to. Glad you like it. 
Chow's shop is just about my favorite place. Am right. Chow number one. Chow said, masterfully flipping an egg in a skillet. Issei and Chow whooped together like they were at a sporting event cheering for their favorite team, and Ria's couldn't help but laugh. They were just so familial. She was almost jealous. You're probably wondering who the old guy is, huh? Why we're so close, I mean. Issei said, almost as if reading her thoughts. I was. You two are like peas in a pod. Ria said, smiling. Issei was a dirty street orphan. Chow took him in. Chow said, proudly gesturing to one of the pictures on the bar. In it, Chow was making Raymond with a 10-year-old Issei, who looked to be having the time of his life. He's right. I left orphanage after orphanage and just coming back to Chow, so eventually CPS or whoever just let me hang around. Now I'm more than old enough for it not to matter, but yeah we got tight. Issei explained. Man. I don't know if CPS Child Protective Services has a Japanese equivalent or anything even remotely similar, but we're assuming pretending it does. Roll with it. Rias was silently stunned. Issei was an orphan. She never would have guessed. But that would explain why he and Chao were so close they pretty much were family. Wow. Ria said, not really sure what else she could say. Three best in Japan specialty Raymond, ready to go. Chao said, saving her from having to come up with anything else. He set three black earthenware bowls down on the bar, one in front of each of the two teens, and one on his side of the bar in front of himself. The miso ramen itself looked delicious, with a fried egg on one side of the fluffy noodles, and a slab of tender pork half submerged in the savory golden broth. Seaweed and spices were scattered around the dish, and the bowl itself made the whole thing pop just that much more. Wow, that was fast. Ria's remarked. He'd only just begun to cook, it seemed like. Chow is the best ramen chef in the country. Of course he's fast. Issei said, matter-of-factly. MMM. Well, go ahead. Chow said, agreeing with Issei and nodding his head towards the bowls. The three of them clapped their hands and bowed their heads. Thanks for the food, they all said in unison. Ria's, not being a native in Japan, was mostly unfamiliar with the ins and outs of their odd pre-meal ritual, but she knew the basics enough to act like she knew what she was doing. That is to say, she'd only ever seen it in an eye before moving to Japan. Issei and Chow both dug in, but Ria's was hesitant the two of them ate like madmen, slurping and smacking and burping and making all manner of undignified noises, not unlike how starved cavemen might have acted 10,000 years ago. The poor girl was conflicted. Every proper bone in her body, which is to say all of them, screamed at her to use restraint and decent manners, but they both seemed to be going at it, and something about the sight made her just a little jealous. See, in her high and mighty household, she'd have been heavily reprimanded if she'd ever been seen eating like that, and she'd always had a bit of a secret desire to just pig out over a meal without a care in the world. Issei and Chao were doing just that, and she wanted to jump in and join them, but at the same time she still felt her family's morals creeping down her neck. Inwardly, Ria scoffed. She realized just how stupid she was being. What influence did her family have on her here, in a dinky ramen shop in downtown Kuo? She slowly began to tear into the ramen herself, drawing a mildly surprised, but also just a little prideful expression from Issei. He was a bit spooked to see someone so proper devouring something like that, but also proud she'd cast off her family's conditioning. He didn't have the first clue about her home life, but he suspected that she'd be punished if she'd ever ate like that amongst family. Plus, the tarot card she'd drawn earlier in the day the Hierophant reversed, spoke about the rejection of family values and the casting off of rules. He began to see that in her, now. You got a crush on her or something. You're looking at her weird. Chow said, in accented English. Nah, just thinking about how she probably doesn't get to eat like this often. Strict family. Arranged marriage strict, even. Issei replied in similarly accented English, Ria's looking between the both of them with an odd expression. See, they thought they were being sly and talking around her. They might have been, if Ria's didn't speak English too. Ah. Chow spat, disdain written on his face. Must be tough. Glad she's enjoying it. Back horse. Rias could have spoken up in English and ruined their secret chat, but chose not to. They hadn't said anything bad, after all, but she did feel odd. Nobody had ever pitied her for being part of the Gremory family before. And slowly, she realized something. Issei and Chao weren't even related, but they were more family to each other than her actual parents had been to her for a long time. Rias loved her mother and father, sure, and they absolutely loved her, but their desire to micromanage her life, culminating in this awful arranged marriage, had driven a wedge between them, and they certainly weren't exceedingly close nowadays. She felt a pang of jealousy for the kinship Issei and Chao shared, but didn't react to them otherwise. She just pretended not to speak English, and blankly looked between them. Sorry, sorry. Issei started, back in Japanese now. Chao is actually who taught me English. M.M. I learned it while I lived in the States. 
Chow explained, smiling. You lived in America? Riaz asked, intrigued. She'd never been to America, but she'd heard it was the closest to where she was from, culture-wise. Sure did. Met my wife there. Chow said, a proud smile on his face. Is she the one in that picture? Riaz asked, beginning to put the pieces together. MHMM. My better half for 50 years. Chow said, the first calm words he'd spoken so far. He sighed happily, and Riaz caught a glimpse of longing in his eyes. So Riaz, how's your first time at a lowly Raymond shop? You look like you like it. Issei remarked, subtly changing the subject. He didn't want Riaz to ask what happened to Chow's wife, not because it would bother him, but because she'd probably get uncomfortable with the answer. It's fantastic. You're very talented, Mr. Chow. Riaz said, smiling. She really meant it she hadn't eaten Raymond very many times, but she could tell his was top-notch. Maybe even the best in Japan, truly. Damn right. And don't say mister, it makes me feel old. Chow said, waving his hand dismissively. Wouldn't want that, would we? Issei said with a sarcastic smirk, and he and Chow shared a big laugh while Riaz giggled. Oh, right. Almost forgot. Chow said, standing up from his position at the bar. He dug around in a bag under the bar, and after a second he pulled up with an ornate bottle of sake and three cups. Got some of the good stuff. He said, handing the bottle to Issei. Issei read the label, then whistled in appreciation. It was some good stuff. Chow's shop was by no means mainstream, but every so once in a while, a businessman would stop in and have Raymond and company that was so good, he'd send Chow a gift as thanks. This time, it was a fancy bottle of sake. Issei handed the bottle back to Chow, who began to pour it in the small sake cups. Do you drink? Issei asked Riaz, who nodded. Normally with meals, but a couple of times recreationally. My family has a high alcohol tolerance. Riaz explained, shedding some light on why a proper teenage girl was okay with drinking sake from a sleazy guy in a Raymond shop. Cool. This stuff is low percentage, so a cup with a Raymond won't get anybody drunk. You cool with that? Issei asked. Inwardly Riaz smirked. The thought of liquor getting her drunk was laughable. Sure, she said. Needing no further instruction, Chow placed the now-filled glasses in front of the two teens, a bowl of ice in each. They all began to sip sake as they ate and talked, and to Ria's, it felt less like a meal and more like a social affair. She was greatly enjoying herself, and for a moment, Ria's was just a normal girl out for lunch with a friend. She wasn't Ria's Gremory, next in line to the Gremory throne. She wasn't Ria's Gremory, fiancé to Riser Phoenix. She wasn't a king or an heir or even a devil. She was just Ria's. Issei's friend from school. And she liked it. Then Ria's phone buzzed, and her wonderful fantasy came crashing down. It was Akeno, asking for Ria's to quickly come to their club room at Kuo. She sighed in disappointment, or more like annoyance. Gotta go? Issei asked, anticipating that she'd have to leave at some point. For her type of person, free for a whole afternoon meant nothing to do at this very moment, but subject to change. Ria smiled, but there was a slight sadness to it. Yes, I do. Urgent club business, Akeno says. Thank you very much for the meal, Miss Chow, it was wonderful. She began to reach for money out of her pocket, only to be stopped by both Issei and Chow. On the house, Chow said with a wide smile. I treat, remember? Don't sweat it, I'll find some way to mooch off you. Issei said, smiling. Ria smiled back, standing up from the stool. Thank you both. See you tomorrow Issei. She said, waving at he and Chow as she exited the shop. They both waited a second until they were sure she was out of earshot, then Chow yanked to say over the side of the counter. How the hell did you get a girl like that to hang out with you? Chow yelled with a grin, giving the boy a noogie. Issei laughed, not really sure himself. Alright sister, I level with you. I got no idea what you're saying. Issei was sheepishly rubbing the back of his head and looking down at a blonde girl dressed in a nun's clothes. She'd approached him on the street and asked him something in a foreign language that sounded like it could be related to English, but he couldn't understand a word. The poor girl looked lost, and Issei wanted to help, but the language barrier was just too steep. She was speaking in a Latin-based language, but for the life of him he couldn't understand her, he guessed it was Italian, but really had no solid idea. The blonde rattled off some more words, slower this time, and Issei caught a fragment. Michiamo Asia. The girl spoke slowly and deliberately, heavily gesturing to herself when she said Asia. But your name? Issei asked, not too dense to pick up on body language. He pointed at her, confirming her words. Asia. See, see. Asia replied, excitedly nodding. She'd been trying for a while now to talk to a stranger, but no one seemed to speak anything but Japanese. This boy in particular spoke English however, and while that was still yet a far cry from what she understood, it was closer to Italian than Japanese by quite a bit. So, she tried a lot harder to communicate with him than she normally would have. 
are you looking for a church? Issei asked, trying to piece together why an Italian in a nun's robe would be in Kuo. The only Christian church they had was long abandoned, a place for children to hang out near and dare their friends to go inside. No one ever did really enter, and it was almost an urban legend among Kuo's youth, some kids even said they could hear voices coming from inside or claimed to have seen beings in cult robes coming and going. None of that really mattered at present of course, but it was the only place he could think of that Asia might be going. As Issei spoke, he made hand signs to go along with his words when he said you he pointed to her chest. When he said looking, he made a gesture like he was peering off into the distance with his flattened hand over his eyebrows. Finally, he clasped his hands together as if in prayer when he said church, hoping she'd get the message. Luckily for both of them, she did. Asia nodded once more, having heard the cross-cultural question loud and clear. Issei furrowed his brow and pursed his lips, trying to think of something. He couldn't send her to the abandoned church, could he? But then, where else could he send her? He couldn't think of anyone in Kuo who spoke Italian of all things, and he didn't want to just leave her. Finally, he came to a conclusion. If she could see the church, she'd never want to just go inside, and then he could find some way to tell her that's the only one. A perfect plan. Issei nodded, admiring his strategic skills. Alright, follow me. Issei made a hand motion for her to follow him, which she did without wasting any time. As he turned to start heading towards the church, she walked right beside him. I'm Issei, by the way. I'm Ichiyama Issei. Issei mimicked what she'd said earlier, hoping he was correct and assuming it meant my name is Issei Dotty was, and Asia smiled in greeting. Now, Asia looked as happy and carefree as a puppy, but Issei was floundering. His main skill was in communication, and not being able to communicate properly was seriously hindering his ability to help. Then, with a sudden realization, he fasciped hard enough to make Asia flinch. The poor girl looked at him worriedly, but Issei just waved off her concern as he pulled out his smartphone. He sent a text to Ria's, first. More out of curiosity than anything, as he never expected a positive reply. You wouldn't happen to speak Italian, would you? Then, he opened up the main reason he'd gotten his phone out a translation app. Before he could even put anything in though, Ria's texted him back. I do, actually. Why? Issei smirked. Of course she did. Which meant she probably understand what he and Chao were saying in English several days ago. Sly girl. He closed the translation app, instead choosing to put all his chips on Ria's. You busy? I could use a hand. No, I'm free. What's up? Found a super lost Italian in a nun's uniform, but I can't talk to her BC, she only speaks Italian shocker, I know. Call me. Within moments, Issei's default ringed and went off, Ria's on the other end. He answered without hesitation. Hair Ed, how's it going? Issei asked, slowing his pace as he and Asia walked. The nun looked at him in question, wondering who he was talking to. Not bad, so far. So, are you still with the Italian nun? I can talk to her, if you put her on. Ria said with an audible smirk, mildly disbelieving that he'd managed to find an actual nun in the middle of Kuo town, and instead convinced that he'd stumbled on a cosplayer in character. Sure, here goes. Issei pulled the phone away and extended it towards Asia, who looked at him with confusion. She took it from his hands, but just held it in front of her, instead of actually putting it up to her ear. Inwardly sighing, he gestured for her to listen into it. Thankfully, she followed the instruction. See? Michiamo Asia, Asia repeated, not at all expecting to be answered in her native tongue on a phone handed to her by a Japanese teenager speaking English. Nevertheless, Asia's face lit up as Ria's answered in flawless Italian, shattering the language barrier and relieving the girl's worries. She began to rattle off more words than Issei could even count, and he briefly wondered just where in the world Ria's had come from. Was it a small wonder that she spoke Italian and had red hair? For sure. Did he care enough to ask? Not really. After a moment of back and forth conversation, Asia handed the phone back to Issei. So what's the play? He asked Ria's, thanking Asia. I'm not far from you guys, so I'm going to head over and help out. The church she wants to go to is currently closed down, so I'll need to help her find accommodations. Uh, what? How is that a you problem? Shouldn't we talk to like, a police officer or something? Hmm? What do you mean? You're just a student. Not to sound like a dickhead, but what business of yours is it to find lodging for a nun? Issei sensed that he may be being a tad bit pushy, and that was most certainly a loaded question, but Ria seemed to be doing something far out of the ordinary, and he'd felt something was off about her for a while now. He wanted a clue. Ria's, on the other hand, cursed under her breath. She'd momentarily forgotten how perceptive Issei was and let slip that she was a tad bit more than just a student. She was absolutely sure he'd noticed, so her next move was vital. Well the way I see it, I'm probably one of the only people in town who speaks Italian, so I thought I would be a good place to start. Unless you'd like to use Google Translate. 
She spoke with an added accusatory yet humorous edge to her voice, trying to guilt trip Issei into backing off. All right, all right. Is chuckled. My bad. She told you where we are, huh? Issei decided to bite for now, but he still had a lingering suspicion that something was odd about Rias. She did, yes. Look up. At her odd statement, Issei looked around. It wasn't hard to find Rias, what with her having a completely different hair color than everyone in town. She stood out like a sore thumb. As their eyes met, Rias waved and the phone call dropped. She was across the street from the pair, waiting for the crosswalk to signal for her to move. Rias? Asia asked, pointing at her in a way that would probably seem rude to most people. See. Issei replied, nodding down at her. But the devious murk, Issei pulled up Google Translate again. A hilarious idea had crossed his mind, and with haste unparalleled, he typed into the phone. Diamala Signorina Rasa, Asia. Issei said, pointing at Rias and hoping he didn't mess up the pronunciation too bad. Man. This was literally me using Google Translate. If any Italians are out there, I apologize for nothing. Asia giggled. He messed up the pronunciation very badly, but she understood the basis. He wanted her to call Rias Miss Red, a joke about her crimson hair. The two shared a smile while Rias finally crossed the street. About time. Issei commented sarcastically, despite the fact that Rias had made it there in record time. Tao, Suora. Rias spoke directly to Asia, ignoring Issei for the time being. But in mere moments, Asia was speaking faster than the poor boy could follow, Rias easily following suit. Asia almost seemed to talk more with her hands than her mouth, and frankly, he didn't know how Rias could keep up. Once again, he briefly wondered if she may be a native Italian, but quickly quashed the thought when he remembered her red hair and pale complexion. He wasn't entirely sure, but he felt pretty confident that those generally weren't traits of the average Italian. Humming, Issei. While lingering in his thoughts, Rias and Asia had already begun to walk off without him. Coming back to reality, he quickly followed. They walked for about 15 minutes before passing by a park, which wouldn't have been significant in the slightest if it weren't for the little boy sobbing by the entrance. There was blood on his knee, a ruined ice cream cone splattered nearby, and his mother was trying to console the poor boy to no avail. Without a moment's hesitation, Asia rushed to the side of the crying boy and clasped her hands over him in prayer. Is she praying? Issei looked puzzled. He supposed it might be a normal thing for a nun to do, but it seemed awkward. Looks that way, huh? Rias replied, a bit confused herself. Big boys shouldn't cry, Asia spoke gently in Italian, and while the little boy couldn't understand the strange nun, he was calmed by her words. Don't worry, I'll help you. Asia put her hands to the boy's skinned knee and began to pray. A soft green light shone from two beautiful rings on her middle fingers, and boy's wing began to close. Issei looked dumbfounded, and Rias eyes widened. Is she is she healing him? Issei asked quietly, not believing his eyes. Rias, though she vaguely knew what was happening, realized Issei absolutely did not. She put her hand just centimeters away from the back of his head, an invisible spell flaring to life in her palm. She meant to wipe the past few seconds from his memory to stop him from wondering about Asia's seemingly supernatural healing ability, but something odd happened for the first time in her life, Rhea's spell utterly failed. A bewildered look crossed the Reteed's face for a fraction of a second. She'd never, ever had a spell do that before. It wasn't even like a barrier or something, it was just as if the spell itself had simply ceased to exist. Issei turned back around to face Rias, who straightened up and fixed her expression. She resolved to find out what had happened later, instead choosing to focus on keeping Issei from asking too many questions. Without the help of magic, she doubted her ability to keep the truth from him for long, if he chose to dig for it. Issei was just too keen. Did you see that? He asked, eyes wide. Um? See what? Asia. Rias asked, playing dumb in a very effective way. She pretended to have been looking another direction. Issei turned back around. Asia was helping the boy off the ground, and his mother thanked her and rushed away with him in tow. Issei faced Rias once more. You really missed that. Missed what? She wiped the blood off his knee. Are you feeling okay? Rias put her hand to Issei's forehead, feeling for fever in a joking way. Unbeknownst to him, she was trying to use a mind-affecting spell again. This time the spell went off correctly, but something felt odd. She could tell it had worked though, and so she chalked it up to some personal mistake. Issei exhaled through his nose and exasperatedly pushed her hand away, but he supposed she was probably right. After all, it wasn't possible to just heal someone, was it? Right. Guess I wasn't looking close enough. Issei lightly shook his head, then rubbed the bridge of his nose, feeling like a cloud had come over his mind. Say pronta. Rias asked Asia as she walked back to the pair. The nun nodded happily, pleased to have helped someone. Where are we going, anyway? Issei asked, massaging his temples and trying to work the odd feeling out of his head. 
It was not unlike the sensation one might get after staying up far too late, an odd sense of fogginess pervaded his thoughts, and he found it difficult to focus. When Issei was leading Asia, they had been headed towards the church. Now that Riaz was in charge Issei noticed they were heading another direction entirely. Asia hasn't eaten anything in a while, so we're going to go to a restaurant and talk over lunch. You haven't eaten yet, have you? Uh no. The weird feeling in his head began to lift, allowing him to focus a bit more. Uh, yeah, no. Not yet. I was actually heading to Chow's when I bumped into her. Issei slowly blinked, then opened his eyes wide and rubbed them with his fingers, like he was trying to clear the crust off his face after waking up from a long sleep. Great. I know just the place. I, I can't go in there. What? The three of them were in the ritzier part of Kuo, at a restaurant Ria's and her family frequented. It was far and away one of the most expensive in town, and even the mere sight of it made Issei sweat. It was simply called Castle and he knew it well. I can't go in there. No worries, I'll just head over to Chow's. Why in the world can't you go in? Don't worry about the price, I'll handle. It ain't the price, sister. Issei cut her off. He pursed his lips, trying to find a good way to tell her why he couldn't enter. I, I have a history with this place. There wasn't really a good way to say he'd been banned for stealing, was there. Suddenly, Issei's glaring contrast to Ria's came crashing down on him like a waterfall. He was just a poor boy from the streets, and she was practically nobility. He didn't really think about it much, but they were on two completely opposite ends of the spectrum, and this was a stark reminder. You have a history with this restaurant? Ria's asked, disbelieving. Asia looked back and forth between them, not really understanding what was going on. The nun was a little nervous herself, having only eaten at a restaurant very few times in her life. Yeah. Issei's light mood visibly darkened. Riaz didn't really even know where to begin. She didn't get the chance Issei, putting on a chipper face, began talking again before she could reply, dismissing her entirely. Look, I can see you got questions, and I'll answer them, but for now, let me just say I can't go in there. For real. Why don't you guys go on without me? I'm pretty much dead weight now anyway, I can't understand a word of what she has to say. Issei waved his hands for emphasis, truly serious in every sense of the word. Are you sure? We can go somewhere else, it's not a huge deal. Nah, hey. She deserves a good meal, since she came all this way for nothing. Issei cut her off again, waving away her concern. I'll see you at school tomorrow, cool. Let me know if you need anything. Without another word, Issei began to retreat. Uh, yes, yeah, see you tomorrow. Riaz was a little dumbfounded. She'd wanted to bring Asia somewhere to talk, sure, but in reality her main goal had been nothing of the sort. Really, what she'd been after was to thank Issei for taking her to Chow's Raymond shop a few days prior, since they hadn't charged her anything. Ria spared no expense when it came to her friends, and she wanted to pay Issei back by giving him a great meal at a fantastic restaurant. She had no idea it would have such an effect on him, and it made her feel a bit guilty. The speda un memento, signor Issei. Man. Once again, if this Italian is bad deal with it. Blame Google Translate. Issei turned around to see Asia running up to him with urgency in her eyes. You need something? He asked, wondering why she chase after him. Ah crazy mill, Signor Issei. Asia bowed in thanks, trying and failing to mimic the Japanese custom. The heart was there, though, and Issei appreciated it. He gave her a thumbs up and winked, then continued on his path towards Chow's. MMM castle, huh? Bad as it may seem, you made the right move. Yeah, I think so too. They'd have called the cops if I tried to go in there. Issei sat at Chow's bar, idly playing with some disposable chopsticks, while Chow washed dishes at a small sink in the back of the room. Nobody else was around, and a little old TV hummed away with some sitcom in the corner. Still, I think you should apologize to that girl when you see her again. She was probably just trying to thank you, twerp. Yeah, you're right. I dunno what came over me, it was weird. I just felt out of place. Well, you've never done anything legal in that part of town until recently, so it would make sense to be uncomfortable. Finishing up the last dish, Chow sat down across from Issei at the bar. I dunno kid, seems to me like turning her offer down would be the right thing to do, but she may be more than a little hurt. After all, it was kind of random of you to just leave like that. You've probably got her feeling just a bit stifled. I'll apologize at school tomorrow, no worries. The soft breeze gently rustled the trees, shaking a cascade of leaves down to Issei. They all missed except one, which landed right on the tip of his nose. Issei, being half asleep, paid it no mind until the leaf began to tickle him. It left his face, then lightly brushed his nose and eyebrows until he was forcibly grinning. He opened his eyes. Riaz looked down at him, smirking. Cozy. Issei laughed. With the way her red hair fell down towards him, it really highlighted how pretty her eyes were. I was. Napping during class. 
Honestly, I should call Sona. Issei was lying down in Rhea's garden yet again. This time however, the two were quite a bit closer than when first they'd met. You got me. I was totally about to nap this time. Issei lazily sighed, closing his eyes again. He yawned, then spoke again. So, what happened with Asia? She'll be staying here for a while. Transfer student program. Rias answered, trying to resist the urge to mirror his yawn. It seemed to say serenity could be a bit contagious. Really? That's pretty cool. MHMM. There was silence for a moment as Rias went around the garden and tended to some of the plants that needed it. There was a full water pail and leaf clippers already there, making the work easy. Hey, so about yesterday. Issei started, not opening his eyes. He heard the trickle of water onto flowers stop as Rias began listening. What about yesterday? She asked, eager to hear what he had to say. Sorry for bailing on you like that. Fancy places make me nervous, castle in particular. It's alright. I should have thought about that before I drug you all the way out there. Nah, you're good. But, I guess you wanna hear why I can't go into castle, right? I will admit, I'm interested. You don't have to say if you don't want to, of course. Sure, sure. Anyway, here's the long and short of it. Remember how I was a dirty street orphan, as Chow put it. I seem to recall something like that, yes. Well, at the height of my dirty street orphan career, I turned to thievery to try and feed myself, on account of you know, starving. Castle in particular was one of my main targets. Didn't take me long to get caught, of course, and the owner was anything but sympathetic. That rat bastard handed me off to the police and banned me from his stupid restaurant, end of story. This was a couple of years ago, so maybe he's cooled off since then, but I'm still not allowed to set foot in that place. That about sums it up. Hope you don't think less of me, but I figured I owed it to you to set the record straight. Riaz was silent. Issei had been starving. Less than even a few years ago, he'd become a thief to save himself from dying on the streets. In her mind, the act of him being weird about going into the restaurant meant nothing, now that she knew why he'd been so adamant about it. I had no idea. Riaz said, feeling more than a bit guilty. Really? What part of Dirty Street Orphan didn't register with you? Issei asked sarcastically, cracking an eye and looking up at Riaz. His attitude changed when he saw her expression. She was as crestfallen as a person could be. Hey, whoa, why the long face? He asked, offbit by her amount of concern. She was looking at him from the other side of the garden with a heartbroken look on her face. That's awful, Issei. I'm so sorry you had to go through something like that. Ria spoke genuinely, with more care in her voice than he'd heard from just about anyone. Ah, I get it. You're the idealist type, aren't you? You hate to see suffering of any kind, anywhere. Issei asked quietly, not really intending for her to hear him. She did anyway. Nobody had ever said something like that to her before, so she didn't really have a response ready. Regardless, she answered from the heart. I do. It makes me feel useless to know people are going through so much and I haven't done a thing to help them. Haven't you, though? Issei asked abruptly, interrupting her. Ria's tilted her head, not quite understanding. Well, I may not have known you for a long time, but let's take stock. In the brief time we've been friends, you've helped me in Asia. For just under a week, two's a pretty good count. You don't seem the type to turn a blind eye even if you've got the perfect chance, is what I'm saying. Don't beat yourself up over something you had no control over, Red. Issei closed his eyes again, letting the gentle breeze soothe him once more into carelessness. Riaz, on the other hand, was having a bit of a crisis. Nobody, not one person, had ever said something like that to her. She'd been called nice before, but never had she gotten such genuine praise from even somebody close to her, much less from someone she barely knew. She felt something weird something she wasn't familiar with. Her face turned a little red, and her throat tightened up a bit. I see. Rhea's normally confident voice cracked, making Issei look up at her once more. She wasn't facing him, making him wonder if he'd said something weird. Interrupting their conversation was the school's bell, signaling the switch from one class to the next. Ria snapped back to reality, and Issei groaned. All right, you've had your moment of tranquility. Back to class. Ria's good-naturedly shoot him away as he stood up, making the boy chuckle. Fine, fine. See you later Ria's. But the moment Ria's was by herself in the garden, looking off towards where Issei had left to. Something felt off, but she couldn't tell what it was. Her heart was going a mile a minute, and she had no idea why. Then, it dawned on her. How in the world had she helped Issei? Absorbed as she was, she never heard the window of the old school building above her open up. Don't beat yourself up over something you had no control over, Red. Rias gained an atomic blush as she looked up to see Akeno sticking her head out of the window and mimicking Issei. Akeno. Issei, hands in pockets, walked down a street in Kuo. It was just a little drizzly, but not so much that he needed an umbrella just enough to give the day a muggy kind of feeling. 
He had some headphones in, playing music from a far outdated iPod shuffle while he walked. All in all, it was his favorite kind of day. He was already in a bit of a good mood. Chow had hooked him up with some stellar lunch, like always, and had given him some spending money, essentially an allowance. It used to make Issei feel a bit uncomfortable, taking money from Chow until the old geezer revealed he was pretty well off, not quite rich, but definitely not hurting for cash. The old man wanted his war to focus on his studies instead of getting a job, so he covered Issei's expenses for pretty much everything, not that the boy was a frivolous spender to begin with. That said, having been a street urchin for some time, it always made Issei feel larger than life when he had money in his pockets. He was walking through a downtown area with no real destination in mind until he spotted something familiar. A full head of red hair sticking out of the crowd like a sore thumb. The grin quickly plastered itself on his face. Now, Riaz and Issei had been friends for a couple weeks by this point. They'd only hung out outside of school a single time since the incident with Asia, but nevertheless they continued to hit it off every time they spoke, and each learned something about the other every single time they met. Issei, as attentive as he was, had picked up on something she worked very hard to conceal. She was easy to mess with. Whether it was because of her upbringing or because she had superstar status, she was one of the single most fun people to pick on, and good fun of course. Occasionally, she would give as good as she got, and her witty banter was second to none, but when it came to pranks and jokes, she was as fresh as a spring chicken. Issei couldn't have been more excited as he stalked her from afar, affirming that she hadn't seen him yet. Once he knew she hadn't, he slowly closed the gap between them, working his way through the people silently like only he knew how. She was standing still in a crowd flowing around her, watching something on the street side. From his distance, it looked like the entrance to an arcade flashing rainbow lights framed a door with an equally flashy sign hanging above it. As he approached, Riaz glanced around, and he carefully ducked behind someone next to him to avoid detection. Because of his upbringing, or rather, the lack thereof, he was beyond skilled at hiding in a crowd, and not even the person he hid behind noticed him, much less Riaz. The girl, having completed her cursory glance, took a hesitant step towards the arcade. She looked around once more, then took another step, and another. As she drew just a meter from the door, Issei struck. Hi. Riaz nearly jumped out of her skin as she instantly turned around to face Issei, who retreated back a couple steps and laughed. She sighed and held her head in exasperation, both relieved and disappointed that out of everyone, he was the one who'd seen her. Watch it, boy. You going to the arcade? Issei peered past her into the door. It looked near empty inside, a perfect time to visit. Is that what it is? I was wondering. Riaz admitted, looking inside once more. What? You were wondering. You don't know what an arcade is. I know what an arcade is, Ria said indignantly, I just didn't know what that's what one really looked like. She seemed intrigued by the arcade, but turned once more to say, pushing it to the back of her mind. But never mind that. What are you up to? No no, don't never mind that me. Did you just say I don't know what an arcade is? No. I said the opposite of that. Sounded like it to me. Let's go inside. What? I can't go in there, I. Be what? Mom and Pop gonna find out. Ria's glared daggers at him. As much as she didn't want to admit it, it was true. She'd never in her life been to an arcade, or a theme park, or a roller rink, or anything of that sort her parents wouldn't let her. It isn't something a princess should do, they'd say. Well. I'm waiting. Issei egged her on, by this point in their friendship knowing full well why she'd never been to an arcade. Come on, this one has a great dance dance revolution setup, and I'm friends with the owner. It'll be fun. Maria's knew she should say I'm really busy, sorry or something to that effect, but she just couldn't bring herself to. Truth be told, she wanted to go inside, very badly. Say it, say it, say it. Sure is say, I'll go in. That's all it would take. Fine. I'll come in for a minute, just to see what it's like. Add a girl. Come on, they've got a killer claw machine. There are a lot of things Kaneko expects to see on one of her arcade days. Prizes and food, obviously. The owner of the arcade, duh. Couples, high-score fanatics, families with kids, all frequent. Even then, she's seen some pretty weird things there's not a whole lot that would surprise her. But if there's one thing that would. It would be Ria's, with a human, on one half of the duet dancing machines, performing her absolute heart out to the song Butterfly. Having just entered the arcade and come face to face with exactly that, Kaneko decided maybe she'd eaten too much candy and immediately headed for the door. Hey, I think we got the high score. Issei, sweat dripping off his brow, pointed to the screen in front of he and Ria's. Sure enough, Red Ice was now at the top of the list, just above head ass and her dumb. Ria's, looking a little frazzled but not quite as exerted as Issei, pumped her fist in the air with a bit of dramatic flair. 
when they'd come in, Issei had started taking her around all of the different games and machines, and the first thing to catch her eye had obviously been the flashiest thing in the place Dance Rush Stardom, a two-player hyper-physical dancing simulator. She'd been apprehensive at first of course, but after watching Issei try it out she was hooked. They proceeded to spend about an hour on the same machine until they'd just got the high score. Both of them were remarkably fast learners, and while Issei was lighter on his feet, Ria's had reflexes that blew his mind. The end result was that her dancing was quite a bit faster and more precise than his, but he had a stylish and smooth flair to it. So what's next? Ria's asked, eagerness in her voice. She couldn't hide the excitement in her eyes, and any thoughts about being reserved had been blown away. But Issei looked around, wiping the bead of sweat off his head, while his eyes searched for something else to keep the princess entertained. He figured it wouldn't take much. How about air hockey? Hineko stood in the doorway of the arcade once more and beside her. Oh, wow. You weren't kidding. She's totally hooked on him, huh? The Kendo Himajima. Told you. You owe me candy. Haha, <laughs> guess I do. One second. The Kendo held up her smartphone and snapped a quick picture of Ria's absolutely destroying a say hi to at air hockey. She lowered her phone and pity quickly took the place of her smile. I guess I'm gonna have to talk to her about this, huh? If she falls for some random human, it'll seriously cause problems. Or the friend chicken will just kill him. The Kendo sighed in concern. Kaneko was right. They wanted nothing more than Ria's to be with someone she loved rather than had chosen for her, but a human wasn't the right choice. I know. And I think she knows that too. The two of them watched her in silence for a moment. She looked so happy. Almost more happy than they'd ever seen her, and certainly more happy than they'd seen her in a long time. What do we do? Kaneko asked, looking up at her senior. The Kendo cast one more glance at the two. Issei just lost his second round in a row, but they were both laughing. Let's go. She's having a good time. Akeno ushered the rook outside, choosing as the queen not to disturb their master. They've up yet. Ria's held out her air hockey striker in challenge, waiting for him to match her. Okay, okay. You win. I concede. Instead, he held his hands up in surrender. She was merciless and way faster than him. The score was 4-1 in Ria's favor. That's not an individual game score, mind you that was total wins losses. Issei was pretty convinced she'd let him win that one, too. So, you've beaten me at my own game. Anything else you want to humiliate me in while we're at it? Ria's hummed, thinking it over. Effortlessly beating you again does sound nice, but I'm kind of curious about that. She pointed toward something Issei's brain tended to actively block out when he was at the arcade the photo booth. That's not a game. It's a photo booth. The photo booth. A relic of the forgotten past, really. Issei put on a dramatic tone as Ria's walked in a circle around the booth. It had curtains on either side so light couldn't get in and was just barely enough for two people to fit in if they were close. Let's try it. Really? It just takes cheesy low-res pictures. Let's try it. Eagerness in her voice, Ria's impatiently grabbed Issei's shirt as she herself flew into the booth. They both fell onto the one seat inside and ended up with her in the far right of the booth with her back to the corner and him nearly on top of her with his back towards the left entrance. Smooth moves, red. Issei had a light blush as he positioned himself in a more modest way, not trying to do anything to her she think is weird. Ria's laughed, glad she'd been on the giving end of the nonsense for once. She'd given up on any pretense of acting high and mighty or being reserved at this point and was just a girl at the arcade. Sorry, sorry. I'll be more careful next time. Somehow I don't believe that anyway, lem see how this works. Issei fiddled with some buttons on the panel in the front of the photo booth and all of a sudden it word to life. The screen appeared in front of them, shining in from a projector behind. All it had on it was a countdown. 3. Issei didn't think the countdown would be so sudden. He couldn't really think of a pose, so he just put up a peace sign with his left hand. 2. Ria's realized it was about to take their photo, so she wrapped around Issei's right arm with her left and flashed a peace sign with her right hand. 1. The picture booth flashed intensely bright light, startling Issei and making Ria's outright flinch. A shutterstock sound effect played, and the projection started again. I think it's gonna take another one. Issei said, preparing. Ria's was inclined to believe him until the photo booth started to whir, and the projection stopped, leaving them in near total darkness. Or maybe not. Ria's replied, noticing it was starting to print two large pictures out of the panel. What the hell? It's supposed to print a bunch of small pictures, not one big one. Issei looked mildly confused as he took the two photos. He couldn't really see anything, so he handed them off to Ria's and started to get up. As he exited, he turned around and extended his hand towards her to help her up. Princess, Issei exclaimed sarcastically as he helped her out of the photo booth. Ria's laughed. 
He sounded obnoxiously similar to her actual servants at home. Once she was up, she spared a glance towards their freshly printed photo. Ria's was on the left, with a peace sign on her right and Issei's arm in her chest. She had a big grin and her eyes were wide open. He was on the right, with a big dopey smile, and his eyes totally shut while he held his peace sign to the left. They were both enjoying the experience, but he was clearly enjoying something else too. Ria's laughed out loud when she saw the picture clearly. They looked just like a normal human couple on a normal human date. That bad, huh? Issei asked sheepishly, wondering how rough the picture must have been to make her bust out laughing. No, not at all. I love it. Ria's held out the other copy to him and folded hers neatly in her pocket. She had a sincere smile on her face, and the unexpected intensity of the moment made him just a tad embarrassed. You do look like you're enjoying your arm in my chest, she followed up, giggling. Issei choked on his own breath when he saw it, realizing his cherished moment of unexpected second base was forever caught on camera. After a moment, he started laughing with her. It was just so cheesy. Alright, alright. You got me. Anyway, you ready to move on? Lot of games left to play. Issei said, gesturing around to the arcade to all the stuff they hadn't done yet. Let's. Ria's was interrupted when her cell phone went off. Oh, sorry. Give me just a second. Sure, sure, by all means. She pulled her phone out to check it, and sure enough there was a text from Sona. Got a jet? Issei asked, figuring someone like her was busy yet again. I do, but not just yet. I've got a few more minutes, so let's make it count. Alright, alright, alright. That's more like it. Remember that claw machine I mentioned? Ria's placed a picture frame down on her desk, right beside a small stuffed toy. Is that a plushy dragon? Cute. Hey Akeno. I didn't realize you were still here. A plushy and a new picture? Someone's been busy today. These are just souvenirs. I can tell. Is that a say, in the picture? Yes, it is. You two look pretty close there, Yufufu. Is that a photo booth? How Momo? Oh, did he win you the stuffed animal too? That's O-C-U-T. Shouldn't you be doing something right now? Live, Red. Bria's jumped awake as she felt a jab in both her sides, letting out an ungraceful yelp as she shot to her feet. Issei chuckled as he sat down next to her, ignoring the glares of sheer hatred her band of worshippers cast his way. She happened to be glaring quite a bit herself, this time. Something wrong? You look peeved, Issei said, blinking innocently, as if he hadn't just been the reason for it. Do I ug? Ria sighed and sat back down at their lunch table, choosing not to engage him in any banter that would require her to think very hard. Her head was in her hands, her normally uniform and neat hair was matted and disheveled, and there were very uncharacteristic bags under her eyes. Issei was a little surprised he tried to think of another time when she hadn't looked flawless and came up blank. This was a first for him. The two had been talking off and on for quite a bit following their outing at the arcade and had evolved into pretty great friends. That hadn't lessened any of the glares he got from socializing with her of course, but at this point he'd learned to live with it. That bad, huh? Long night. She hummed in the affirmative. MHMM. I'm exhausted. Well, my bad for waking you up then. Next time I'll just slide in all smooth like and let you lay on my shoulder, Issei said with a cocky smirk and a cheesy finger gun. Ria snickered weakly, looking directly down at the table with her hand supporting her cheeks. She looked miserable, and the sorry sight tugged just a bit at Issei's heartstrings. Unlike usual, you really don't look so good, Red. Why don't you go lay down somewhere for a while? Too busy. Lunch is my only break today. She paused mid-sentence to yawn rather cutely, in Issei's opinion, and planted her face directly on the table once she was done talking, hands cupped over the back of her head. And did you just say I normally look good? Issei couldn't see her face, being that it was pressed firmly into the table, but she was smiling brightly well, brightly for her current state, anyway. She wasn't the type to blush from such a comment, but something about hearing it from Issei made her happy. I called like I see it, he answered, not losing his smirk at all as he shrugged her question off. Then he sighed and addressed the actual conversation. Dizzy, huh? What with, if you don't mind my asking? Of course I don't mind. Just schoolwork, nothing majorly important. Her eyes stayed shut the entire time she spoke, though Issei really couldn't even see that with her hair all splayed out over the place. He sighed, a little annoyed at how little care she was currently taking with herself. Geez, you are a sorry sight. Okay, I'm convinced. Come on, he said, standing up. Ria's turned her head over, looking at him with a bit of confusion in her eyes. What? I said come on. We're gonna skip. I can't skip, I have a club to run. Sona would never let it go if I did something so irresponsible. So? So, I can't skip. Who cares what Sona says? You probably worked yourself to the bone on school shit last night, right? Nobody would fault you for skipping out on a bit today. 
Besides, you're miserable. I can tell. Bria's looked up at Issei, whose eyes were light with concern. She hadn't really taken him for the caretaker type, but it wouldn't be out of character at all with what she'd seen so far. Truth be told, it wasn't schoolwork that had kept her up all night it was a stray hunt, gone wrong. And even with her special composition, she wasn't so invincible she could just stay up for hours and hours on end and not get tired, especially during the sunny daytime. All in all, she wanted to argue. She really did. But Issei wasn't really having it, as he put his hands under her arms and gently but firmly lifted her up from the lunch table. Once she was up, he let her go, and she begrudgingly stood on her own two legs, shakily leaning back and forth next to him like a strong breeze would push her over. Issei had to resist the urge to pick her up entirely, since it might be a bit too forward for him to do a prince's carry. That would be a little weird for a guy to do to a girl who was engaged to someone else, right? Fine, fine. Fine. But I'm throwing you under the bus if I get caught. No, you won't. I'd bet all the money in the world you would never throw a friend under the bus. You're too nice, he retorted, confident in his assessment of her character. Bria's glared daggers as she slowly meandered beside him, trying to keep her feet from slipping out from under her. He might have been right, but it kind of undermined her threat. The poor girl staggered as she began to walk, so Issei put his left arm around her shoulders to steady her, hoping she wouldn't think it was weird. To everyone else in the lunchroom, it looked like Issei was walking far too close with Ria's, but it's not like they could actually do anything other than glare. So what's your plan? Something inspired, I'm sure, she muttered, finally having accepted going along with his nonsense. I'm gonna walk you to your club room, and then I'm gonna leave and let you take a nap or something. There was a moment of silence as Ria stared dumbfounded at Issei, not sure she'd heard him right. I thought you said we're skipping. That's more like you're skipping. My skipping is entirely independent from yours. I'm just skipping. Sona is going to. The C-A-R-E-S what Sona is gonna do. You're exhausted and miserable and deserve a break. I meant you. Oh. Sona can bite me. Ria's laughed, despite her exhaustion. Issei's carefree forthright nature was such a far cry from everything she was used to, and if she really thought about it, she didn't particularly hate him taking the time to care for her. As a matter of fact, between his care and the comment about her appearance earlier, she kinda liked. As the thought crossed her mind, Ria's eyes widened. If any other guy tried to put his arm over her shoulder and lead her around, she'd probably slap him silly, if any other guy mentioned something as superficial as her looks, she'd simply ignore him. But with Issei, it felt odd. It wasn't a feeling she could put a name to, but she was also certain it wasn't something she'd felt before. All of a sudden, as Ria's began to have an inner monologue with herself, her throat tightened up and her heart started beating just a little faster. Ria's, You still in there? Your face is all red, Issei said, cutting into her thoughts by waving his free hand in front of her. I'm fine. She replied, just a little bit too loud. She didn't say anything after that, not trusting herself to say things properly when her mind was swirling so oddly. Issei just chuckled, figuring she was just tired and irritable. He gently rubbed her shoulder, filled with pity for the poor overworked girl. And with that, despite her outburst and conflicted thoughts, Ria's leaned into Issei just a little bit more. The two of them continued down the halls of Kuo, headed towards Ria's clubroom. Unbeknownst to either of them, Akeno had been watching from far behind. To her right was Kiba, who had pity written all over his face. Oh wow she's got it bad, she said quietly. It certainly does seem that way, Kiba agreed. When Akeno and Kaneko had told him about her escapade at the arcade the other day, he almost hadn't believed them. Ria's Gremory, having a crush on some random guy. It seemed far-fetched to him. But now, watching them walk almost arm in arm, he saw the truth. This is so not gonna end well, Akeno mumbled, smiling pitifully. Maybe maybe we should just leave it be, Kiba said, turning towards Akeno. Maybe this is what she needs. He seems like a good guy. Akeno sighed, not responding right away as she watched them disappear down the halls. I want Ria's to be happy more than anyone, she finally said in a voice barely above a whisper, worry all over her face, but if this keeps up Riser will be furious. Kiba closed his eyes and looked down at the ground, knowing Akeno was right. The last thing either of them cared about were Riser's feelings, but they both know how psychotic he could be if he got angry. But still, isn't that the happiest she's been in a while? She's earned this much, he offered, still trying to find some way to rationalize leaving them alone. All that has occupied their president's mind for the last several months had been the thought of her arranged marriage, and she'd been depressed to say the least. But now, with a say, they couldn't see a hint of her sadness. She absolutely has, and I'm so glad she's finally found someone, but what happens when Riser finds out? What if he hurts his say, or worse? She'd be a wreck, Kiba added, finishing her sentence. He knew Akeno was right, but that didn't make it any less painful of a truth. But there's not much we can do about it, right? 
she's already got a crush. She's got a crush, yes. But as of now, it's just a crush, and I'm not even sure he feels the same way yet. I think I'll just keep an eye on them, for now. And if they do get closer? Kiba asked hesitantly, almost afraid of the answer. Then we may have to do something, Akena replied, cryptically. The thought of interfering in her king's relationships turned her stomach, but if it meant potentially saving Rhea's heart and Issei's life she'd do it. I hope it doesn't come to that, Kiba grimaced, sighing. Just like Akeno, he'd hate to have to meddle with Rias and Issei, but the marriage situation was too complex. At best, she postpones things and angers her parents, and at worst she gets her crush murdered by her jealous fiancé. Me too, Akeno whispered. All right, here we are, Issei announced, stepping into Rias' clubroom. Nice place, he added, surveying the high-class, Victorian-style clubroom. Not sparing it too much of a thought, though, he spied two couches in the center of the room around either side of a coffee table and began leading Rias to one of them. The poor girl was almost falling asleep in his arms, the exertion from the longish walk to her club room, finally having drained the rest of her already depleted stamina. Her eyes slowly drifted open and closed, and she leaned heavily on his say for support, which he tried his hardest not to enjoy too much. All right Red, here you go he said, gently sliding his arm out from around Ria's as they approached the couch, guiding her onto it. She slumped down onto the furniture without complaint, nearly falling asleep as soon as she hit the soft leather. On the back of the couch was a conveniently placed row blanket, neatly folded. Issei grabbed and unfurled it, letting it fall over Ria's. She quietly hummed in approval and pulled it tight to herself, apparently enjoying the comfort. Geez, you must have been way more miserable than you let on, huh? Issei murmured, pity on his face. The normally refined and dignified Ria's gremory was acting almost like a tired child, not that Issei minded. Standing back up and taking a quiet breath, Issei took one last look to make sure she was comfortable before he began to turn towards the door. Just then, however the quiet calm of the club room was interrupted by a loud, obnoxious ringtone. The noise seemed to be coming from Ria's, and as the half-asleep girl irritatedly dug around under the blanket without even opening her eyes, it confirmed Issei's suspicions. Even now, her phone was going off. Something else for her to do, he was sure. So, as she pulled the phone out and went to answer it, Issei swiftly intercepted, taking the phone from her hands without much resistance. At that, Ria's opened her eyes, apparently about to object, but Issei put a finger to his lips in a shh gesture, cutting her off. Issei she quietly complained, weakly reaching for the phone without even getting out from underneath the blanket. What if that's important? Nope, he replied, declining the call. Only thing that's important right now is you taking care of yourself. If it gets you in trouble, I'll gladly take the fall. As if to prove his point, he held the phone in front of her and let her watch as he turned it off, putting it down on the coffee table just out of her reach. Ria's, not convinced, began to stir, seemingly aiming to get off the couch. Ah, Issei chastised, waggling his finger. If you get up, I'm telling Chow you said you hated his ramen, he threatened with a smile. At that, Ria's laid back down, defeated. A smile graced her face, and she closed her eyes once more. You wouldn't, she retorted, even though they both knew she'd lost. Oh, really? Issei asked, seemingly challenged. Ick, that Raymond from the other day was soooo gross. I hope I never have to eat dirty low-class food like that ever again. Issei mimicked Ria's voice, putting on the attitude of a stereotypical teenage girl, as he pretended to talk like her. Ria's laughed quietly, then leaned back on the couch, allowing herself to be comfortable. I don't sound like that, she shot back, eyes only half open. Of course not. Your voice is actually fun to listen to, Issei assured, smirking. By the way, in the interest of me avoiding having to drag your semi-conscious body across the school again, I'll give you some advice. Next time someone wants to run you to run yourself ragged, tell them to screw off. Be selfish. Life's too short, Rias. Think of yourself more. With that, he once more began to leave, turning towards the door. He was interrupted once again, however, when he felt a hand gently grab the back of his shirt. He turned his head to see Ria's loosely holding on to him, stopping him in his tracks. Thank you, Issei, she said quietly, smiling faintly. At some rest, he replied with a wink, before finally leaving the room. After he'd closed the door behind him, Ria's pulled the blanket up to her face, covering her mouth as she smiled brightly. Almost nobody ever called her just Ria's. She was always Ria's Gremory, or Princess Gremory, or Lady Gremory, or any number of other meaningless titles and names. Even her own peerage called her president or king or princess, most of the time. Nobody ever cared about Ria's they just cared about Ria's gremory. And then there was Issei. He called her Ria's so casually, and sometimes even messed up her ever-important last name just for laughs. Nobody had ever done that before, and the thought was so foreign that the first time it happened, she couldn't help but laugh. 
and it wasn't even just her name between his natural kindness, his quick and fun wit, and his utter lack of care for any higher power or authority, he had quickly embedded himself in her mind. And now, going out of his way to take care of her. At the risk of getting in trouble with the student council, no less. What an irresponsible boy. Rhea sighed, stretching out on the couch. Even as tired as she was, she couldn't seem to clear her mind and calm down. Even though she'd been falling asleep on her feet mere moments ago, she couldn't stop thinking. Every time she tried to close her eyes, all she could think about was him. He was just so absurd. Iria's, right. Rhea's Gregothy. What a ridiculous thing to say. The say had to be the only person she'd ever met that just didn't care. Somehow, he was both one of the most caring people she knew, and at the same time he didn't care about authority, he didn't care about families or titles, he didn't care where he was or what he was doing. No matter what or who tried to change him, Issei was Issei. Never had Rhea seen a more caring, carefree soul. Never had Rhea seen someone more different than her. Rhea's Gremory's life was dictated by authority. She was defined by her name and title. She almost never had a say in where she was or what she could do. But when she was with Issei. When she was with Issei, she was just Rhea's. She could go to an arcade, she could eat street ramen, she could skip class to take a nap. For better or for worse, when she was with Issei, she could be herself. And she liked that very, very much. As Rhea's pondered, she slowly drew the blanket up further, covering her entire face, as if the whole world could see her blush. Once more she felt her heart start to race, but she didn't really mind. So, with the sound of her own name and the thought of Issei Haidu, she drifted off to sleep. Several hours later. A cup. Rhea's grumbled and turned on her side, trying to get away from the annoying sound in her ears. Wake up. Still it persisted, so she crankily pulled the blanket up over her ears. Rhea's, wake up. Rhea's gremory shot up from her place on the couch, eyes wide. In front of her was Sona Citri, looking remarkably unhappy. About time. You were five seconds from getting drenched in cold water, the student council president said with a frown, her arms crossed impatiently in front of her. Sona. Rhea's mumbled, still partially asleep. She yawned, then wiped her eyes and tried to recall what had happened. She didn't have to think about it long, quickly remembering how she'd been tired and Issei had convinced her to skip class. Once that clicked, she realized why Sona was upset. Enjoy your beauty sleep. Sona asked, shaking her head disapprovingly. Having finally woken Rhea's up, she moved from in front of the couch over to the lone window in the room, opening the drapes and letting a flood of bright afternoon sunlight in. I sure hope so. It must have been urgently needed for you to ignore all my calls like that. If you're curious, there was a problem with the school festival. I handled it, though. Now, Rhea's first instinct was to roll over and agree with Sona's grilling, her spontaneous and irresponsible skipping could have resulted in any number of problems, after all. But then, Issei's words from before rang in her mind. Life's too short, Rhea's. Think of yourself more. Rhea's wasn't just exhausted, she was downright miserable, and it had been plain to see. Taking a nap had been almost necessary at that point, and still she was getting scolded. Just for taking care of herself even that much. As if she was somehow in the wrong for not working herself to death. Over something as minor as the school festival. The Sayrias was annoyed would be a gross understatement. I'm sure you manage just fine without me, Sona. I was too tired to do anything anyway, Rias retorted, a clear combative edge in her voice. She stood up from the couch, stretching her back with a nonchalant look on her face. With that, Sona turned back to Rias with a surprised expression. The passive-aggressive shot back had been the last thing she expected from the normally diplomatic and agreeable Rias Gremory, far from it, actually. Is that so? Tired or not, a normal student would be punished, you know, Sona replied, wondering what had gotten in her friend. Rias brow twitched. There it was again. A normal student would be punished, Sona told her. A normal student. Not Rias Gremory, of course. She was an untouchable princess. Even to Sona, who was both her longtime friend and a ridiculously strict rule keeper. Even to Sona, she wasn't Rias. Maybe I should be, Rias replied after a moment, frowning. I did skip class, after all. You'd throw a say in detention, at the least. Sona raised a brow in question at the next odd statement her friend made. A say? A say hi do? Sona probed, beyond curious what she was talking about. At that, Rias inwardly grimaced. She hadn't meant to say his name, but he'd been on her mind and in her frustration, she'd slipped up. Sensing Rhea's discomfort, Sona pressed the issue. Is that what happened? You let that delinquent talk you into. Excuse me. Sona was interrupted outright by Rhea's, who sported a very uncharacteristic look of anger. That delinquent is one of the best people I know. It was only thanks to him that I was finally able to think of myself for once, Rhea snapped, walking toward Sona. 
the student council didn't respond, too shocked by the outburst to counter it. He's done more for me in the past couple weeks than any of you have done for years, Ria's growled, nearly in Sona's face. It had been a very long time since Sona had seen this kind of anger on her friend, and it was absolutely stunning to her that all this was for a boy she'd barely known for a month. She understood Ria's was under a lot of stress, with the arranged marriage and all, but this. Ria's had said any of you did that mean any of the student council, or Ria's other friends, or perhaps devil society as a whole. Sona didn't understand. Was Ria's really comparing her childhood friend to a boy she'd only just met? How insulting. Putting aside those affronts to myself and your peerage, that delinquent, Sona repeated, her cold and rigid tone every bit as sharp as Ria's, is one of Kuo Academy's biggest mistakes. The school board allowed him into this academy because of his intelligence and charisma, and he's done nothing but walk all over it since his first day. He makes a mockery of everything it stands for, and still they allow him to have his way. Sound familiar? Ria's eyes narrowed and her jaw tightened. She understood very well what Sona was implying that Ria's liked to say because of his brains and charms, and that he was a bad influence on her. That he was bringing the immaculate Ria's gremory down to his pathetic level, and that she was a fool for allowing him to do so. You're being childish and immature, and you need to open your eyes. Whether he does it or you do, somebody is going to make a fool of Ria's gremory before the two of you are through. There it was again. She couldn't even be friends with a say, because he marrow in the image of Ria's gremory. She wasn't just annoyed or frustrated, now. Ria's was mad. Sona, stop, she said in a low tone, warning the student council president. Judging from her clenched hands and tight jaw, she was very obviously angry, but Sona persisted. Do you even know anything about him, or was it just his cute face and soft attitude? He's just a normal human boy anyway, he's probably only after your body. Ria's slapped Sona in the face. The room became so silent you could hear a pin drop. Sona simply raised her right hand and gingerly touched the side of her face Ria's had hit. It hadn't hurt much, but the meaning behind the action had hurt plenty. Without a single word between then, Sona left the room. Sighing heavily, Ria's plodded back over to the couch and collapsed onto it. She didn't know what had gotten into Sona herself, for that matter. Not really sure what to do with herself, she reached forward and retrieved her phone from the coffee table, turning it back on to see if Sona really had called her so many times. There were in fact several texts and calls from Sona, but above all those was a single text from Issei a couple hours prior, nearly right after he'd left her in the club room. Hope you're enjoying your first time skipping. I know I'm enjoying your G-A-R-D-E-N he'd said, with a cheesy picture attached of himself smiling under her trees. And somehow, despite what had just happened, Ria's found herself smiling. Meanwhile, Issei was still lounging in the garden, long lost in his own nap. His face was a picture of pure tranquility, and every once in a while a soft wind blew tiny green leaves down onto him. All in all, he looked like not a thing in the world could bother him. But, unbeknownst to him, he wasn't quite alone. On the edge of the school grounds, glowering hatefully at Issei, stood a mature-looking woman with black hair and violet eyes. Thanks for watching this video. If you really enjoy this video. Like subscribe and comment down below and turn on that bell notification. Don't forget to support and follow the Belial the Liar for writing that awesome fanfic, and also make sure to comment on this story link in the description. See you in the next video. Goodbye.